Good morning, folks. Uh, I think I forgot to uh, start presenting uh, my screen before uh, we got going. In any case, um, welcome to the uh, Thursday, March 19 um, episode edition of the uh, Alice All Live Stream PD. Um, now from home. Um, hands if you're home with your coffee and you got up after eight o'clock today. Okay. Hands if you are in your robe uh, drinking coffee right now. No judgment. Don't worry. You know who you are. Hands if you're raising hands like I can see you because I can't. But your teacher powers are strong. Your teacher habits are strong. In any case, um, just a word on uh, a re sort of a reminder on working from home. I, I always love these these memes that what my friends think I do um, sitting at home on the TV what my mom thinks I do, Superman, what society thinks I do, just sort of chilling, what my boss thinks I do, the uh, the family picnic, what I think I do versus what I actually do. Um, this is kind of our new normal right now. And um, I forgot to mute my uh, notifications. So um, a lot of that kind of going on. Give me a second while I um, snooze notifications for a couple hours because my Hangout um, <laughs> looks like everyone's getting audio. And uh, you know, that's what that's the power of real-time digital feedback. Okay, so just try to keep these guidelines in mind. Um, so let's talk about the rest of the week and this week. So um, today we're gonna be carrying over from yesterday the idea of classroom community and family and home connections. Um, tomorrow we will be talking about um, digital citizenship and um, common sense media. And um, the live stream will always be at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, Monday, we have a live Q&A. We're not going to prepare um, a, a specific topic. We're gonna kind of let you do live Q&A. We're gonna ask that you keep it to the topics that we are actually experts on. Um, we, we appreciate questions, and if we don't know what the answer is, we try to direct you to the right people or at least the right departments. Um, I've gotten a couple of questions. I'm like, oh, never thought of that. Not sure where to go, but you know, we're trying to look into it. Next week, we're not going to be every day. Um, we do try to give you absolutely the whole afternoons to plan and get ready. Um, next week, we're just going to be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, there's a typo there, but just Monday, Wednesday, Friday, it'll be 930. It will be the same link. Um, so so that won't be new for you guys. Um, new today, however, is in case you didn't um, see the email, our remote instruction resources website is live. So let's jump on over there and take a look. So here we have our homepage. Um, we have that video from Ms. Uh, Mr. Koenig that we got. Oh, in case you didn't know, the board officially improved, Ms. not improved, approved Mr. Koenig as our superintendent. So he's no longer the interim superintendent. Mr. Koenig is officially our superintendent. Yeah, Mr. Koenig. Okay. Um, so the four factors of remote instruction, uh, that graphic, which so many of you found useful is here. The thank yous to all the work, hard work on this page. Um, it's, it's literally been um, so many, so much help. So we sort of have uh, some broad categories, um, lots of help and in, in case, for example, let's take a look at the, uh, the Google Classroom resources. Um, there are slides from us and then there are um, tutorials on down how to, how to do all this stuff in it. And it looks pretty similar all the way around. Um, it will be our resources, then tutorials in case you need um, some help. And um, this is open to everyone on the planet Earth. Uh, if you're not from Earth, I don't know how you're getting here. In any case, um, so I we've gotten some questions from folks. That, hey, I have friends in Salina City or hey, I have friends in other districts. Can we share stuff with them? Sure, everything that goes on this website um, is meant to be shared with um, all the peoples. Uh, some parts are still under construction. For example, the content areas. 
um, but we wanted to get stuff up and, and moving for you. Every live stream will be webbed up here. So if you miss something or you want to go back and watch it again and you don't want to go digging through your email, um, we're going to have a section as well called Made in the LSL. So anything that teachers um, have made that they want to share with us uh, and really, like I said, all of planet Earth, we will put up there. Um, and again, that send it to edtech at lsl.org with the subject line for the web or live stream or both. Um, under other resources, we are um, trying to gather all the sort of everything that doesn't fit into, into those. This is a great interview from Facebook Live um, with this uh, director of innovation and technology named Sandra Chow, who works at a school in Beijing. And when this was done, which was last week, they had already been in quarantine for five weeks. Um, so it's guided some of what we do. Um, we have stuff for parents. We're trying to make sure all our stuff for parents is translated. If um, George or Celia were not in the office, then it is Google translated, and I'm sure it needs to be fixed, and we will fix it. Um, under the parent stuff right now, I'm sure your parents are, um, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the memes about parents behaving like teachers, like, uh, you know, kids home for four days on, on, uh, on shelter in place, parents going, can I have this kid transferred from my class? You know, a parent saying that, ha ha. In any case, we have prepared some guides and we will be updating. And um, thank, shout out to the uh, Family Resource Center folks, AFRC, um, for helping translate our parent guide. But you can send parents here and we will be adding home resources and links to activities and such because, uh, I think screen time norms are gonna are gonna change. In any case, um, you can use that Bitly link. If you lose the Bitly link, I'll show you the long way uh, home. <laughs> so from the district webpage, you go to divisions, educational services, then go to educational technology, then down here under quick links is in all caps, so it's easy to see, um, Alisal remote instruction resources will take you to the website. Okay, so um, back to the live stream. Um, so that's the website. Um, again, if you have something awesome to share with us for the web page uh, or the live stream, um, please email edtech at alisal.org in the subject line, please put for the web or for the live stream or both, if, if it's okay for both. Um, so I'm so excited that yesterday we spent so much time on Meet and EdTech liaisons were telling us from all over the district that they were doing live remote support with their teachers, little um, group help. Um, if, you know, we are a little swamped here in our department this week, um, we should hopefully next week be able to get our heads above water and start being able to help you. We will be opening up remote help um, over Google Meet. But in the meantime, some of the ETLs um, are doing this as well. Uh, please feel free to reach out to them. However, please keep in mind that they are, um, only two of them are coaches, but and the coaches are very busy right now as well. I'm, I'm sure everybody is super busy, but um, they're, they're preparing for their classes as well. So it, it might need to take place. Um, just, just check in with them um, uh, and see what's a good time for them. Let's just all be good to each other, okay. So, Made in the Alice Hall, uh, featuring on the live stream is um, some tips and tricks that we get sent in that we think are great ideas that we want to share with you. And we've got a couple of those today. Um, so this one is from Mr. Hernandez at Loya. And he, we were talking about the captions yesterday feature in Meet, remember? And you can turn on captions for you. And he was talk, we were saying, wouldn't it be cool if it were automatically tied into Google Translate? So Mr. Hernandez, uh, sent me this on out. Um, Paris, hi, this is Mr. H at Loya. In regards to translating in another language live, meaning like from a Google Meet, um, you can have a separate window open with Google Translate and manually click on the microphone icon and set the translation to the preferred language. You are limited to 5,000 characters, which roughly uh, means over a minute of nonstop talking. When there is a pause, Google Translate does pause. 
not the most efficient way to do this, but it works. It's a brilliant workaround. Um, for If you don't know the Google Translate website and the Google Translate mobile app has, um, you can talk right into it. You don't have to type, you can talk and it will listen and translate for you. And on the mobile app, there's a conversation mode where it listens for both speakers and you establish in our case, probably English and Spanish. And when it hears the English, it translates it in Spanish, then it waits for Spanish, puts it back in English. So you almost have like a mechanical uh, translator, little robot in your pocket there. Okay, so this next one, um, we're actually going to have uh, another live interview um, with Miss Yesenia Gutierrez, who is a kinder teacher at Barden and had this great success story about working with her kids on meat and I believe Seesaw, you can see this picture. So uh, let's head over to that interview and just talk to Ms. Gutierrez. Hi, Ms. Gutierrez, how are you today? Hello, Gary, how are you? I'm well. Um, I'm gonna turn my volume up a little bit um, just to make sure that, that the folks at home can hear us. Okay, so why don't you uh, tell us what, um, tell us, how your day went yesterday? How, how are you working with your your kids? You told me one of your kinder kids figured out Google Meet on their own. Yes, yeah, so I was trying to do the slides that you have there. Um, but first, I wasn't sure, so I had to set up the meet and I put it into Seesaw. So when I did my screencast, I was going to be able to um, click on the link. So as I was getting ready to record, I was in the meet and then one of my students appeared and. Like, oh my god, he figured it out, and I didn't even show him how to do it. So, after that, I ended up doing the screencast, um, but then I realized I didn't know how he did it. So, I sent a remind to uh, a group of parents and I asked them if they would be willing to FaceTime with me or go back and forth on reminds with the steps that they had to take to be able to get to the meet. Like, how many clicks on the phone book was it going to take? Got it. So, so you. You had a kid figure it out on his own, and then um, you used Remind, which you had set up with parents, to ask them to start um, getting into Google Meet calls with you, with their kids. Is that under, is that correct? Yes. Okay. That helped me make the slides, so I knew what steps I was going to have to put in. Gotcha. So then um, tell us, once you got kids into Meet, what was your next step? just that group and it was only I think three of them that were able to get through the first time mm -hmm. and um, but it was cute it was really nice to see them they were all really happy so after I thought okay I'm gonna send this out to all my parents now and I just opened it up so I opened it up from five to eight and I told parents like I'm just gonna be sitting in there I, you know message me on your mind and I did have parents that had problems um, but I just told them okay send me a picture of your screen mm -hmm able to walk them through. A lot of them, it was because they didn't turn the mic on correctly. Got it. So mic problems, camera problems. Yeah, and right now I have a screenshot of that, so I can just send all my parents, if you're having an issue, this is where you need to check first. Got gotcha. you. So taking the mistakes that you, you already had and, um, and using that to turn around and troubleshoot for other parents. Got it. And then? You said you did something with slides and seesaw or something? Um, yes, so I, so I made the slides. When I did my screencast that I sent to parents, I showed them, I had my, like seesaw. Well, the call's glitched. I my screencast, so I was saying, okay, right? No, 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 the call's glitched. So you had seesaw on one side and slides on the other? So actually, I made a YouTube video, and I was just walking the parents, like, here's step one. This is what it looks like on your child's Chromebook. Here's step two. This is what it looks like. So I was really going through all the steps, and, and it was successful. I had um, 18 kids on it at one time. Wow, 18, 18 is a lot of kids to have. To take a picture because. Yeah. Um, so I had two different meets going. You had two different meets going. That's kind of awesome. <laughs> so um, our ki I have a question. Our kids can't get to YouTube. So were you sending the YouTube directly to them, like with Remind? Yes, I sent it to the parents. So I, I told the parents, like, I really need your support. Uh, I, I did tell them that I had a student who was able to do it by himself. 
but I ask the parents to sit down with their child and help get them in. Mm-hmm. And then when on the knee, I kept um, asking kids to go all the way out and go all the way back in. So the whole time I was just having them, you know, go back and forth. But the first thing I taught them was the mute button and how to unmute. The first thing is teaching them how to mute. Got it. <laughs> so I kept asking, okay, push the mute button. And then I was explaining, like, you know, that you can see the red. Uh, microphone and how that meant that I couldn't hear them anymore. Mm-hmm. And then I kept, so we kept like playing a game. Okay, mute. Stop muting. Okay, mute. So. And you said you um you got some help uh, with your slides from your BT teacher for for translation. Ms. Alvarez from Barden. After I made them, I figured I just like you. I used Google Translate because I wasn't sure, um, but she went through and she was able to check and she said that they made sense. So they made sense. Good. Yeah, I, I think we're definitely living in the time of done is better than perfect. Um, okay, so uh, last question. Is it okay if we take those slides and put them up on the web for uh, for other teachers to sort of borrow, make a copy, and modify? Yes, I'll, I have permission to, to share those images of the kids I asked their parents. Oh, excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we, I pr- we appreciate you joining us on the live cast today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so thank you very much. Good tips and, and a great story of, uh, of success from, from Ms. Gutierrez at uh, Barden with her kinder class. So one last time, if you would like to be on the live stream, um, you don't have, even have to be camera ready. Makeup is optional. Um, uh, again, or you have resources that you would like to share uh, with us to the website, please um, email edtech at alisal.org. Um, with the subject line for the web or the live stream. Um, some of you might have seen this. I'm gonna read it because I'm sure it's it's kind of small. Um, it's from Ken Buck. I think it's going around Facebook. This kind of looks like a Facebook post. And this was shared to us from Jasmine Root uh, at Fremont Elementary. Um, we gave educators almost no notice. We asked them to completely redesign what school looks like, and in about 24 hours, local administrators and teachers Apollo 13 the problem and fixed it. Kids learning, children being fed, needs being met in the midst of a global crisis. No state agency did this. No so-called national experts on curriculum. The local educators fixed it in hours. Hours. In fact, existing state and federal policies actually created multiple roadblocks. Local schools figured out how to do it around those two. No complaining, no hand wringing, just solutions and amazingly clever plans. Remember that the next time someone tries, remember that the next time someone tries to tell you or convince you that schools are better run by mandates from non-educators. Remember that the next time someone tells you that teachers have it easy or try to persuade you that educators are not amongst the smartest, most ingenious people in society. And please never say to me again, those who can't do anything else, just go into teaching. Get out of the way of a teacher. Watch what happens with amazement at what really happens. So I think that hits us all right in the feels today. Okay, so now uh, we're go- I'm going to stop talking and we're going to throw to George and Celia. So George and Celia, take it away. Yay. Um, welcome, everybody. So already. we're going to continue what we had on for me yesterday. Um, reminder that there's a bit.ly right on the screen. Um, for fostering community. We ended up also um, not just talking about classroom community, but we're going to also include some tips and reminders and um, considerations in terms of connecting with your families as well. And so that's the topic for today. Uh, We're gonna give you just a quick few seconds to get onto the presentation if you'd like. Um, And I'm actually gonna shoot it over to George for just a quick little story for you all. Uh, Good morning, everybody. Uh, We wanted to share with you that uh, we love what we are seeing. We're getting a lot of feedback. One of the pieces that we wanted to share, which was actually really timely, was, you know, yesterday we went over with how to use Hangout um, Meet. And it was really neat because at the end of the day, in the afternoon, I had a couple of teachers that were running into issues and they were, we were able to use Google Meet where they would share their screen and I was able to walk them through what their issue was. So um, 
you know, that'll be an, uh, hopefully a service that we'll be able to provide. And if you're running into things that you have questions about that you are stumbling over, uh, you know, we do have a solution for that. And that Google Meet uh, with those two teachers yesterday, uh, Ms. Griffin at Steinbeck and uh, my goodness, I forgot a teacher at Montebella also. We were able to get to that and yes. solve Ms. Diaz at Montebella. We were able to solve their issue. So that was really cool to see that in action right in the afternoon of the day that we learned this new tool. So with that, back to you, Celia. Um, remember that even though we'll make sure we get all these resources to you, the um, the bit.ly will get you to the presentation and we have a lot of active links on everything. And so again, if, you, if you'd like, it's there for you as a resource. So as a quick overview of today, here are our outcomes. We're going to start off with a quick note about uh, why it's important to build that community and connection to families. We're gonna review four what we're calling tech moves. And so those tech moves will describe and give you some examples using both of our main tools, Seesaw and Google Classroom. We're going to review um, some considerations um, and ask you to think about your intention behind the work that you're sending students. We'll talk about some family connection reminders that we've, we've touched upon before, but again, it's just as an added reminder in case you need the review, in case, um, I know it's been a lot of information and I think for every, for all of us, we're trying to, we're trying to keep up as much as we can. And so we just figure that it's good to, to review as we go and, you know, we do the best we can. So we'll cover that and then we'll have your, of course, always welcome to send in your questions. Whenever you have them, we're monitoring the question form, but if um, there are any lingering questions at the end, we'll take them then as well. So that's what we're gonna get done today. Um, and so again, we're starting off, well, why is this even an important topic? Um, so if you think about our goal to cultivate the whole child for a world-class education, uh, we need to think about not just um, the academics, which of course are important, but um, you know, it's in, in any situation, even if this was just a regular day at school, um, connecting to your students and families is an important topic, but especially I feel like now with so much uncertainty and this is new for everybody, um, we're, I think we all could use a little bit more connection to each other. There's this idea um, roaming around on the internet. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of um, the idea of social distancing. And a lot of times people have sort of changed that from social distancing to physical distancing, just to emphasize that, yes, we want to be safe and like keep some physical space between us. But really, this is the time to be looking to each other and working together. Um, and that is social connection. And so we really do need to maintain that social connection. But um, here are a couple of examples of that. And so this example on the left is actually from a second grade student at MLK um, who sent this message to her student or to her teacher that says, I did my homework today. I talked to Ms. Osorio and my classmates. I'm feeling sad because I miss Ms. Osorio. And so this was actually a, a pretty recent exchange in, in light of all the, the changes that we've had to, to deal with recently. And this example on the right is actually from last year. And this was on my stream on Google Classroom. And this was toward the end of the year where um, I had wished students to, to have a happy summer. And then below my post, students started discussing and they started the little conversation on their own. Um, there was some banter back and forth, but if you look down here at the bottom and you look at that timestamp, even after the entire summer had passed by, they still had students trying to reconnect with each other at the start of the next school year. And so again, like this was last year and students are still looking to connect with each other. And I think it's probably even more important so now. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on those four tech moves again that we're talking about. Um, so those four tech moves that we've, we've kind of packaged together are one, discussion, two, collaboration, three, the use of multimedia, and four, the use of theme. 
We'll go ahead and describe all those in detail, but here's an overview of the four moves. I'm gonna hand it over to George to begin with our first move, which is discussion. All right, let's see here if I can do this. I wasn't ready. You can leave it on for Apologize there, I was not quite prepared. I was actually getting a text message from somebody about, um, about being able to, um, if you have questions, uh, if you have questions as we're having this live stream, where do you go? Uh, first of all, um, I'll go ahead in a little bit, I'll get the bit.ly and kind of uh, let you know what that is so you can go to that Google form, but it's also located in the emails, the communications that have been sent out every morning by Josh Harris. So if you check your email from this morning for the 930 livecast, I believe the link is on there so you can go ahead and you know, if you have a question or uh, or want to know how to do something, that is one way to do it. Again, give me give us a couple of minutes, and we will go ahead and find a way to get that link um, to you uh, through this live cast. So, <clears throat> going back to our first move is discussion. So, as you can see here, um, we're going to use using the Google um, Google um, tool. One of the best ways to create classroom discussion and classroom community is through the question feature. Here's an example of what it looks like. Um, so it really does open up the ability for students to be, you know, where you give them a prompt and students can go ahead and respond to that. And then students can add to, um, they can add to the responses of their classmates, perhaps agree or disagree or, you know, or provide support why they feel that way. So, you know, it's a really good, a really good tool um, that we have on air. And um, one thing on the right-hand side, we have a little bit of a different discussion. This was with regards to a post in um, Celia's classroom last year. And if you notice this one, there is really no structure. So um, one thing that we would ask is, you know, we wanna make sure that we are really meeting the um, social emotional piece of our students. So it's important that we have some structure with regards to the content here, but also that you give them the opportunity for them to be kids, to be, with their friends, to talk to their friends like they would out on the playground or as they're having lunch. So um, try to cr foster both of those kinds of interactions with them and be, you know, um, be mindful of that. Cause I think sometimes we forget we have so much to teach and we focus on the, we focus a lot on the, on the um, content and then we forget about the other piece. So a uh, very important during this time to really um, uh, ha have a balance between the two. So how do you do that? Well, Google probably has the most settings with regards to controlling uh, these types of interactions. So um, the easiest way, uh, the easiest thing to do is to, uh, from your Google class, remember there's two different kinds of settings. There's class settings. And then over here on the right hand side over here, if you press this hamburger, uh, the hamburger, um, icon here gives you the Google Classroom settings. I'm talking about the class settings on here. When you click on that, you wanna to go to the general tab. In the general tab, you will see you will see this option on here along with this little drop down arrow that allows you to adjust what type of um, posting students can do. And here are the three choices. You can go ahead and have a student, uh, you know, students post and comment at any time, however they want. So think of this as the, the Wild West, anything goes pretty much. Uh, and that is probably the most uh, open setting. And then you can lock it down, down to the bottom where it says only teachers can post and comment. And that would be, you know, nobody else can post anything except for the teacher. And there may be a time for you to do that. Um, you know, a good practice may be that you start with a class where it's completely closed. And then once you have shared your expectations with your students, behaviors that are appropriate and not appropriate um, and and then you can start op open that up for them so that they're able to so that they're able to thank you i've got another comment to slow down so i will calm down a little bit too much coffee um so let's see here readjusting my speed here so you can go ahead and choose anything in between. But again, it's really important that your students know your expectations as they are posting in the classroom and that they know that there is a time for them to 
you know, use their academic vocabulary, respond in complete sentences. And then there's a time where they can go ahead and talk with emojis and they're able to, and they're able to start those conversations with their classmates. Uh, of course, still appropriate for school, but um, with um, taking into account their audience, which is their friends in that case. So that's one setting, really important. I think that this is something that um, goes right along with tomorrow's topic on digital citizenship here is, Students need to be aware that whenever they post anything online, it's really never gone completely. And if a student in your class was able to post something that's inappropriate and then they delete it, you as a teacher are still able to see that by turning this icon on. And notice that only teachers will get to see, uh, teachers and co-teachers in Google Classroom will get to see what students have posted. Um, I know some administrators have had to use this tool because of, um, you know, because students are gonna, you know, they're gonna push the envelope. So just be aware of that, that you do have access to, um, to seeing any posts that students have deleted. Um, okay, so that's a really important setting. A second group of settings on here is found inside the question feature. Remember we've talked, about, we've talked almost every day about the question feature in Google. So here you would have the question, and then once you're uh, once you are once you've assigned the question, on the bottom right here, there's a box where you have two options: the students, so that students are able to reply with each other, and students able to can edit their answers. So again, you have choices on here, and I would say with the first one, students can reply to each other. You know, think about your purpose. Do you want students to build on each other's answers? Do you want students to learn from each other? Do you want students to share different perspectives? So you would want them to reply to each other, again, in a respectful manner. It's all about going back to digital citizenship, making sure that we're teaching them those skills. And then being able to edit the answers. That Now, if I'm giving a quiz where I'm gonna assess them, then perhaps I don't want them to edit their answers. But let's say you want a student to learn from each other and then they're able to refine their answer, change their perspective based on what some what another student has said. Very powerful that they can go back and are able to edit their response based on um, what they've seen or read from their classmates. So two settings for you to consider. And again, that is in the question. When you create the discussion question, that is found in the settings there. <clears throat> Now, in the account settings, remember the account settings can be found on the, on, on the hamburger bun at the top left of your class. And these settings are for all of your classes. So down at the bottom, you will see the little cog here. When you click on there, a, an important, um, an important um, thing to remember, and I apologize that this is above this, um, is, um, but I wanted to share is that you, this is something you need to consider. We talked earlier about you being able to receive a notification. I know sometimes right now, if we left this on where every, we get notifications for everything, our email notifications are probably getting out of control. But if you are testing this out, if you wanna see how your students behave at the beginning, it might be a good idea for you to consider turning this on for different, and again, you have choices as to what you wanna turn the email on for, but it might be a good idea for you to get those at the beginning so you can you know, monitor that they are behaving in the way they're supposed to. And then as you see that there's no need to receive an email for all these things, you can go ahead and close some of these edit settings off or turn them off so that you are not bombarded in your emails with notifications. So again, a consideration for you. Finally, we have the, I call these bonus settings because um, this is actually pretty powerful. Um, so in the people, notice that this is in your class, it's a class setting in the people tab on here. We have our students on here. And what I wanted to let you know is, uh, here we have um, a couple of students. If there's a student that is not using the tool correctly, you have options where if you click on that little box, you will see that you have, you, you'll get actions here. So notice that when I click on there, you'll get actions and you can go ahead and actually, you see this little handy, handy tool here? you can actually go ahead and mute a particular student. When you mute a student, nobody else knows that that student has been muted except for you and that student. So a student may be trying to post something and they'll, they, they won't be able to do that. So this is probably something that you might want to do for a student that, ha that you need to have a conversation to about their posting, the way they're behaving while they're in, the, in, uh, in class. 
So mute them. And then what I did, I would always mute the student and then I would have a private conversation with them about their behavior and um, to really think about what they're doing. Um, and once they, we come to an agreement, I would unmute them so they could continue to participate as, you know, as the rest of the students. So really a pr pretty powerful thing on here. Um, and you can go ahead and if you press this button here, you can actually select all your class and just mute them all, or you can select individual students that you may want to mute. So that is a bonus setting in Google Classroom. All right, so then we have, what does the discussion look like in Seesaw? Um, again, this is um, Seesaw's um, discussion pro uh, you know, process a little bit different on here. So in this case, this would be an activity that you would send out through Seesaw. And then students are able to respond here with text. So first of all, if you've turned these settings on, and we'll talk about how to turn these on, students can like each other's work, notice the little heart, so they can heart each other's work. And they can go ahead and type comments to each other, feedback to each other. Here you go, uh, Laura. Go Montebella, Laura Carey here, who gave feedback to one of her students. And then you can see some of the student's classmates and even the student that created this responding to that. So that's a way to facilitate digital discussions within um, within Seesaw. And you know, with, any, with anything, um, set the expectations for your students. If you want them to, to, for example, when they're giving feedback to each other and you want them to use a complete sentence, you need to state that you want to give them prompts like sentence starters or uh, or let you know remind them please use academic language capital letter period so whatever focus or writing you may be working on this is a way that you can go ahead and try to uh, you know give them expectation that they can practice uh, practice those writing skills too oops apologize there so the settings in the settings in seesaw Again, if you are in your class, you want to go ahead and head on up to the little wrench on the top top right hand side. Once you get in there, the part that you want to take a look at is under students. And these three, um, you have three options on here. Um, you have students like and comment, students can see each other's work, and new items require approval. So let's start with the first one, students, likes, and comments. So once you click on that, you will get this dialog box that tells you, do you want to allow students to like? That's the little heart icon that shows up, um, that showed up underneath the post by students. Uh, in addition to that, you have the option, and again, you could turn all of these off or all of these on. You, you, have, um, you know your class better. You know what works best for your students. You know what your intent is as you are po making the post. Um, but those are the control that you have with regards to student likes and comments. On the other piece on here, you have students can see each other's work. If you want students to learn from each other, if you want students to give each other feedback, you this needs to be turned on. So um, that's something for you to consider. Finally, just like in Google Classroom, students may, um, you know, may when they first start using this tool, not be using it correctly. So once you have your expectations and your expectations are clear to your students. Um, you know, you may want to turn this off, but I always like to have it turned on. And actually, I don't know if I've ever turned it off, but um, you want to make sure that every time a student posts something, you are able to see it first. And pretty soon you're going to realize that there's maybe, you know, one, two students that you really need to watch out to what they're posting and not necessarily all the class. So it, it, that, that will, those students that you need to really keep a closer eye out, just like in our classroom, um, you know, you will, um, those will become evident pretty quick. And then you can have the discussions, redirect them and, um, you know, and, and uh, provide support so that they, be, you can, uh, they can change their behavior. So those are the settings in, um, those are the settings in Seesaw with regards to, you know, having these digital collab uh, conversations. Celia will talk about our next move here, which is collaboration. Thank you. So, um, Again, we're going to start off with collaboration in Google Classroom. And so because Google Classroom uses all of the Google tools, you know, one of the awesome things about Google is that a lot of these collaborative tools are already built into all of the Google apps. And so we're giving you examples, but they really can be used with any app in Google. Uh, but here are a couple of examples. These are live links. And so if you're interested in 
seeing these up close, potentially using something like this in your classroom, then you're welcome to take these. Um, this one over on the left is actually a template for like a magazine cover. And it also has like pages inside of the magazine. Uh, but this could be, for example, a collaborative project. And so you could maybe assign students a different historical figure, and then each group would have to maybe design a newspaper or a magazine describing that particular person. And so in this case, you have this template over on the left, and you would want a group of students to be working on it together collaboratively. On the right-hand side, is if maybe you had something that the entire class was working collaboratively on. Um, I think two days ago, we gave you the example of an assignment I sent my students where we were researching the 13 colonies and everybody took a different colony and we all shared our notes on the same Google Doc. This is the same idea, except this, this example in particular is actually a copy of our collaborative notes for the STEAM symposium that um, a few of us from the district went to. And so if you open this document, you'll see that all of these topics here were attended by different people. And so if you were to click on any one of these pages, you'll get the notes from the sessions that all of us went to in the same place, which is awesome. Um, Another aspect of collaboration, especially in Google Tools, is up here on the right. I don't know if any of you have ever noticed that there's this little thing up here. And it only shows up if you're in a, in a document with someone else. If you get this little red dot up here, it means that there's it's notification. And so this example specifically is a, do, a Google Doc that I have with pacing for the wonders units and <clears throat> I invited George as my colleague to collaborate with me on a document but again this could still be for students when you see this notification it means that someone who you're collaborating with has clicked on that icon and as soon as you open that icon it opens this down here at the bottom and so it's actually essentially a chat feature inside of the document. And so if I were to click here, I get this little panel open, and then maybe I start typing a message to the other people that I'm working with. So in this case, I ask like, hey, George, here's our pacing for our unit. And then the other people who are working with you would respond to you. And so again, this isn't anything extra that's built into all of the Google Apps. And so you have that feature as well to teach students to collaborate. So the settings for Google Classroom in this case, I wanna go back to the first example. The very first example, I mentioned this <coughs> template where maybe a group of four students was working on one historical figure together. In order to do that, I would build an assignment in Google Classroom, I title it, give some directions, but from there, I'm going to attach a copy of the template. Make sure that the students can edit this file because they need to work on it directly. And then you're going to select the students that are working together in the group and only them. So you do not want to select all of the students because that means all of the students are working on the one document. In this case, if it's group work, you have these selected students working together on this same document. And then you would assign it to those students in the same group. You would then repeat the process for the next group, attach their template with editing rights, and then select the new four or five people who would be receiving that assignment. A question just came up with regards, um, Celia, to the people, um, the people uh, template, template that you have on there. Yeah. Yes, remember that on the slide deck, once you get the slide deck, 
that is a template that you can use. So by clicking on it, it will actually open up a template, force you to copy it, and then you can use that as you see fit. So yeah, uh, we were saying earlier that a lot of these um, documents have links on there to the actual documents. So thank you for that question. For sure. Um, if, however, you're trying to promote collaboration in Seesaw, um, George and I were talking about this yesterday, and we've the way the best way we can describe collaboration in Seesaw is really that it needs to happen somewhere else. Um, so we're going to use this as an example because the assignments and the activities that you send on Seesaw cannot be worked on by multiple people at the same time without physically being together. And so our solution, recommendation, just an idea, is that you initiate the collaboration. In this case, I have an example here, somewhere outside of Seesaw, for example, in slides. So this is a very similar idea to that template that I have where we were studying theme. I gave them direction or some examples of themes to my students. I gave them directions on one slide and then left empty slides so that each member of the group could take a different slide. I sent this out. They collaborated on the same Google slideshow. And then once they were done collaborating on Google, then they could go to Seesaw click on the green add button as we've shown you and then they can upload this file that they worked on from their google drive so all of the students in this group right four students would go to their respective journal on seesaw and then upload the file onto their journal so that they have a copy of their own work as well as their group mates because this is a collaborative document but really um, because Seesaw doesn't have that feature built in easily, this is our recommendation for collaboration in Seesaw. I think we're gonna switch over to multimedia next, and so I'm gonna hand it off to George. All right. <clears throat> I'm back here and a quick little question that we'll address before we get on to multimedia. There was a question that came in about um, about this, uh, about students being able to chat with each other. The question was, can students ask questions here? Um, yeah, so students can ask questions. However, the questions that are asked will only be seen by the collaborator. So in this case, Sally and I are collaborating on this. So if you were a teacher, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> you would see this you would see this differently but what will happen is Sally asks a question and then the other the rest of their classmates could respond to that and i've definitely seen this used really well with uh, upper grades especially fifth and sixth grade where they're solving their own problems they're figuring it out and i'm not having to respond to that so um i hope that answered your question with regards to uh, you know students be, being able to ask questions on their on their collaborative document all right so now we're gonna continue with multimedia. So another thing that you can use to, um, you know, to create classroom community and, uh, you know, is to use the multimedia features of Google. We talked about earlier about you being able, you could do it as a material, or you could, uh, or you could do it as a post on here. Um, you could go ahead and the multimedia that you could add could be a video. Um, we have already talked a lot about a tool that you can use, which of course is Screencastify. Um, as a video that you can use to share, you know, so students can see your face or they can see each other's face. Once your students are able to and they understand how to use Screencastify, it would be, you know, you could go ahead and have them post a video of themselves talking about their day or, you know, whatever the prompt is so they can upload a video and that video is just uploaded from their Google Drive, um, just like what we learned uh, with Screencastify. There's also the ability for you to, uh, for students and um, and you know and you as a teacher to add audio uh, audio as part of the multimedia. So don't ever underestimate mul uh, multimedia, especially the video piece in in this uh, in this case because your students 
need to see you and, uh, you know, and they also crave and they want to see each other and their classmates. So those two tools, um, you know, uh, can be used in, in, Google, in Google Classroom. Um, so what I wanted to let you know is that once you, um, in order to get to this tool, you go ahead and you click from the document that you're working on. It could be a Google Doc uh, or, or it could be a Google, I'm oh, sorry, there's a Google slide on here. You can go ahead and click on what you want to insert and then you it'll it'll ask you to get it from your drive there. So that's where it accesses the doc, the documents. Um, sorry, the multimedia files. So hope that was helpful there. Celia, do you have something to say here? Just about Google tools in general. If you if you're looking to add multimedia through this these steps that George outlined, the options that you get require you to get the media from somewhere else. So you're gonna get it from YouTube if it's a video, you're gonna get it from your drive if it's an audio file. So it's not something that is native to Google Apps. You need to use an extension, another program. You can pull it from YouTube. You can do a screencast and now you own that video and then can embed it. But it's not something that happens inside of the Google Apps. Just a quick little note. Thank you, Celia. So here is an example in Seesaw of using audio. So as you, um, you know, it's it's of using audio. And uh, one of the things that, that I didn't share earlier is that when you um, when students provide each other feedback, they can do so with. Uh, earlier, I showed you that they could type their feedback, but students can also record feedback on here. So again, you want our students practicing their English, their academic vocabulary. Uh, they can go ahead and record the feedback. Very powerful for those for those students that need to practice their English or Spanish if we're in a in a DI class, right? So think about that. And um, so so it's a it's a very powerful powerful tool on it. But also for our students, you know, think about our non-readers, uh, the little the young the little ones, or maybe our English, uh, you know, our newcomers that that are working on their language and they can't necessarily write yet, but they can speak. They can go ahead and add. Uh, audio responses or audio feedback to each other. So um, that's and that's built right into Seesaw. And of course, also built into Seesaw is the video option. You saw that earlier with the video camera. Uh, here we have, of course, uh, Ben, who uh, is awesome with this tool. And he has been creating these types of examples for a long time where the students can see his face and he's able to teach little mini lessons using um, multimedia. And again, Powerful thing is these little ones, his kindergarten, his uh, kinder rockets get to see him and get to see their teacher every day. So check out some of the stuff that he is doing because it is pretty amazing. Celia is gonna, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and um, talk about theme. Actually, I think we're, we're getting pretty close to um, about an hour since we started. And yeah. so I'm actually gonna, insert a break right now and make sure people are getting up and stretching. So we're gonna start our timer for 10 minutes and we'll see you in about that much time. Thank you.
And we're back. <laughs> Um, we wanted to answer a couple of questions. There are a few questions that came up um, during the break that we took a look at. Uh, one was about creating small how-to videos for students instead of having right all 300 teachers create their own. So we're planning on doing that to relieve some stress, right? Instead of having you all do that, we're going to work on that. We'll make small little how-to videos so that students, for example, know how to access Screencastify, which was another question. So again, all students have access to it. It's an extension that was pushed out to all of the students. And so if they've never used it before, we, we will link all of these little how-to videos to our website. So then you can direct students to go there and then they can learn how to do that themselves. Two. Some people have noticed that sometimes there's a little bit of a lag to the videos. And there was a suggestion from somebody that instead of waiting for it to catch up, you do like a quick refresh or reload of the page, which will probably solve your problem faster than if you had just waited. So, you know, sometimes that happens, especially with different um, internet speeds at work, at home, all the different homes. So there's an idea for you in case that helps. Okay. Um, again, feel free to keep um, sending in those questions. We're actually at the t at the tail end of the training for today. We're going to get into the fourth tech move. And the fourth move that we're going to be advocating for is what I call theme. A little bit of an explanation and just to say that we need to find a little bit of balance with addressing academics and really checking in on our students just as people. And a quick little shout out to all the administrators watching, um, just to remind them to check in with their teachers as well, because it's stressful times for everybody. And just if you look at the example over here on the left using Google Classroom, here's an example of a quick question, right, which we've been showing you how to do. I could, for example, ask my students, oh, hey, write an IVF sentence for yesterday's reading. I could do that, and it's a question on Google Classroom. But we also want you to remember that connection is also important. And so sometimes maybe we let go of the academic content briefly at some times. And so maybe I changed that question from thinking about an IVF sentence to, hey, maybe just list three things that you're grateful for. Maybe you start a lesson with asking them, how are you feeling today? Maybe the question is, um, send us a picture of what it looks like outside your window. So something that's not academic so that you have that connection first, and then you can address all of the academic tasks that students have to do. Um, so it's important to just check in, right, as people. On the C side, <laughs> seesaw side, they actually have a filter for social and emotional topics. And so if you went into Seesaw and you went into the community library, as we've shown you, and you filter out by social emotional learning, you're going to get to this page. It is also linked, and so if you wanna just click on the link from, from these slides, you're welcome to do that. But these activities on Seesaw are addressing social emotional needs. And so depending on what all of these are, they, they address those social emotional needs for students. And so again, thinking about how to balance all those like human connection and needs that are more SEL to things that are academic. That being said, we're going to go into some things that you might want to consider. And we think of this kind of as a, a summary of all the things that we've talked about so, so far. Um, to think about what your intention is with students and their assignments, different things to consider. Uh, we started off even earlier with George. He was mentioning how we need to find that balance between academics and social emotional learning. We reviewed what these considerations look like from a technical aspect 
on both Seesaw and Classroom. And this chart basically just outlines the different things that you might want to consider. So under the Seesaw side, we talked about looking at each other's work, enabling likes, enabling comments, notifying uh, the teacher for different posts and, posts and comments. Um, we haven't talked about this last part, but that's right coming up right next. Mm -hmm. On the Google Classroom side, we talked about students only posting, students posting and commenting, maybe muting individual students, notification for posts. And this last part is also coming up next, maybe changing an icon for students on their Google account, or maybe changing the class name or theme that can also, again, build that sense of community for you. And so to start off, those last two points that we hadn't gotten to yet is, for example, maybe changing the display name for either yourself or your students. And so if you're interested in doing that, you're going to go into settings, and it'll open up this box where these items are already pre-populated, first and last name, and even for teachers, it's pre-populated. But if you want Seesaw to display a different name, you can change it here. The same for students. You would click on a student's name, you can go into their display name, and maybe, for example, they prefer a nickname. And so you can change this display name to whatever the student prefers. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, Celia, because think about, you know, our identity. You know, a lot of times our name is part of our identity. And if a student wants to be called Zach instead of Zachary, then, you know, we want to respect that. That's part of who they are as, you know, identity. And related to that, too, um, if you're going to be sharing some of the student work, you know, to the greater community, even outside of your classroom, perhaps to the district, you may want to not display their full name. So instead of saying, you know, instead of giving Zachary's whole name, why don't you just put Zach uh, so that, or just their first name so that when things are being posted and you're sharing those to other classrooms, other schools here within our district, or perhaps outside of the district, they're not seeing your full student's names. So it's kind of twofold on here. It's about a stu the student identity, what they identify as their name, and then the other pieces about uh, digital citizenship and then privacy and security type of issue, which is a preview for tomorrow. That's true. Um, and I also wanted to um, just mention this little quick thing is right underneath the display name, students and teachers can also pick an icon. And so again, it's just one of those things that makes it a little more personable, a little more customized for both the teacher and the student. And so maybe showing students how to do that or changing it yourself um, is something you might want to do. On the Google Classroom side, uh, we use this as an example of, for example, changing the theme of the classroom. So whenever you make a Google Classroom, it defaults to a theme. It usually picks it for you. You can, of course, change it to different options. But in this example down here at the bottom, we've customized it with an actual picture of the class. And so, and like the logo of the school, again, something to just make it a little bit a stronger connection to the students and so they feel more connected to a Google Classroom. Yeah, good point there, Celia. Um, you know, that picture kind of throws back some memories, but um, uh, you should have seen kind of how the just the change in the students to their classroom when they came in, when it was just, when you saw the generic, you know, test class students, and then when you saw their pictures on the at the top of their class. It really creates a sense, it really adds to that sense of community and this is all of us together. So consider that and it's a really easy, uh, a really easy thing to do. For sure, and if you wanted to do that again, you would just go to upload photo. If you haven't before, again, it's just a consideration that you also have on the Google side, the ability to change an icon for a profile. And so that's the little picture that shows up for both students and teachers. And um, I know sometimes teachers uh, don't allow students to change that or maybe change the, the wallpaper on their computer. But just because of the times that we're in, we would at least ask you to consider it. Like, would it make it, would it build community if students were allowed to change those aspects of their account? So again, just food for thought. 
Okay, so we're going to switch over to how to make connections with your families next. I'm going to hand that off to George. Okay, initially, this was going to be a totally separate, uh, you know, little PD, but we figured we could uh, fit it in in here because it's not going to take us very much, uh, very much time. But again, family connection. If, you know, obviously we can't see a lot of our families face to face, so we need to go ahead and try to create that from uh, in, with, with our digital tools on here. So um, let's get started. In Google Classroom, um, there's a couple of things that you can do. And remember, you are, um, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with um, from the people page on there. From the people page, you already have all your students on there. If you have emails from your parents, <clears throat> parents can go ahead. Uh, you can go ahead and add their email and invite them to the class. What the parents will see will be, um, you know, their just their own child's work. And related to this, if you click on the if you click on the gear icon of your class. It'll take you to this setting here, <clears throat> and this is pretty. Uh, this is pretty cool. If you want, so once you have invited guardians in there, you can go ahead and, on a weekly basis, if you turn this on, the parents will receive an email that um, that tells them, oh, you know, this are your child's all the work that your child has done. These are all the missing assignments. These are all the you know these are the assignments that are coming up. So it's a really um, it's it's a summary that parents would get every week with regards to you know the work that their student that's due from their students or the work that they have completed. So once you turn that on, you will get this dialogue box here. And then uh, what you want to do is you'll have to make sure that that's checked off and then click on add to the class. And finally, up here at the top, you want to make sure that, you, that those, those settings are saved. Uh, just a little bit, you know, just always be on the lookout for this save setting. Sometimes Google is really good about automatically saving things, and sometimes you have to make sure that you apply those settings. So to apply those changes, you want to click the save button. If you want to take a look what, um, you know, if you are wondering, not sure what this looks like, if you click where it says, um, oh, yeah, yeah, my apologies there. If you click where it says see example, it will actually give you, uh, it will actually take you to a page, a, a, a Google page where it actually shows you what these summaries look like. It's really, um, if you haven't seen those, you should really check them out. And I think uh, this is definitely one way for us to um, to get our families, our parents, our guardians into, um, in, into our classes so that they can see how their students are doing and what their students are, what their children are working on. So that was the, um, you know, that's how you do this in classroom. Sally is going to go ahead and talk to you about how you do this in um, Seesaw. Perfect, so um, so I switched over to, um, back to the presentation with some Seesaw examples. And so we're actually gonna start off on your classroom page. If you're at your classroom page, there are different ways of doing this. I think previously we had shown you to go into your settings and then there are family settings. That's still applicable, you can still do that, but one of the easier ways is right from directly from your home page of your class you're going to go down to the bottom and click on add families and so when you do that you're going to get this option so it's going to open up another window where you can invite families by email or mobile number if you have them you can directly type it into here and it'll send them the invitation if for whatever reason you don't have them there are a couple of other options First off, this option up here at the top. You can click on this link to print actual physical invitations. And so if you click on this link, it'll open up another option, uh, which we've already talked about, but again, just as a reminder, that if you wanna print these invitations, you can customize the language that you're going to send this to. So if you need these in Spanish, you can click the drop down menu, select Spanish, and it'll print the invitations and directions in Spanish for you. The other option is to go up here and click on invite link. So this will create a join link. And so if again, you have a way to get this to parents, then they would click on that link to select their student, actually ask them to select their student first. It takes them to a page. They click on their son or daughter or child, and then you approve them as a family member. So you can definitely do that too. 
just to back up a little bit, this is probably the best page, that mm -hmm. once you pick whichever way you want to invite parents, there is a column right to the right of the students' names where you'll get an invite status. So you'll know whether or not you've invited somebody, whether or not they're waiting for approval, or whether once they are connected, it will say connected. And so again, this is just a way for you to monitor who is and who's not connected. Once you do have parents connected, we wanted to call attention again, another way that you can reach out to your parents if they're connected on Seesaw. I'm gonna go back to the homepage of a classroom and I'm gonna call attention to this inbox button. On the inbox button, you're gonna have a couple of different options to reach out to your parents. You can go to the main page and send an announcement. So we've already described how an announcement goes out to everybody. If maybe you need to send a picture of a flyer or um, just a, an announcement for everybody to see, you could do that here. If, for example, you need to send a private message to one of your connected parents, you would do it down here where they would be a list of connected parents. This parent has connected to their child and so that's why they show up here. So if I wanted to send a message to this particular parent, I would click on the name of the parent, and then any correspondence would be private to just between the teacher and that parent. So that's an option as well. There's one more feature. Um, you may or may not want to start experimenting with, with it, but just as a quick little overview, there is something that's called a blog on Seesaw. And it's the fifth button over here on the right. There are different um, settings that go with the blog that you also may want to investigate. Remember that the settings are up here um, in the corner, but if you open the settings for your blog, you're going to get this, these options. If you want to enable it, you would turn it on. If you want students to be able to decide if something goes on the blog, you would turn that on. There are extra, extra settings in terms of appearance and who can see them and connecting other blogs. But in short, the blog on Seesaw is a way to connect not just parents or guardians, but the larger community. So if a student posts something on the classroom blog, anybody who has a link would be able to see it. So the actual, the background of this page uh, shows that when I click on that blog icon, you're going to get a link. That link is the link to your blog if you have it enabled. And so if I wanted to get this blog out to maybe aunts and uncles and cousins and the different schools and the district or literally anybody in the world, anybody who has access to this link will be able to see the things that you or the students put on the blog. Not all of the posts default to being on the blog, so you actually have to go into the item this item, for example, Henry decided that he wanted this item on the blog. And so he went to his post. Down at the bottom, there's the, the little blog icon on the actual post. So you can click on it if you enable that students can post to the blog, and it will then show up for anybody who has the link to your blog. That's it. But if you don't want certain items to show up on the blog, then you wouldn't click on that little icon. If later somebody changes their mind and Henry says, you know what, never mind, I don't want this on here, you can just click on the little icon again and it'll take it off. So, um, Celia, so yeah, quick comment on that. So, I believe as a teacher here, you, um, uh, that setting that says students can post a blog, you can turn that off and you can have the blog. I apologize if you said this already. You can have the blog running where you, as a teacher, are the only one that is posting to the blog. So you get to determine what gets posted so that students don't, aren't just posting things without your approval. So you can turn that off. And like Celia was saying is, 
uh, under blog settings, you have the ability so that only, for example, only students in the class can see the blog, maybe only students in Alisal can see the blog, or anybody in the world, as Celia was saying. So think about what your purpose is. And uh, again, th um, you know, do, you, uh, think about your purposes and how you want to set that up. Right, yeah, so just think about your intentions <clears throat> and how this could potentially help you to create community. Um, but it's just another another consideration to take in mind. That being said, we're going to I get ready to finish up. But we have a couple of questions, a really good question. Questions. So I'm gonna share my screen on here. And I didn't get permission split from Ben, but since I'm a co-teacher in his class, hopefully that means it's okay for me to do this. The question was earlier when we talked about, um, about displaying the names of students. And this had to do with um, the classes that are pre-populated by Clever, which have the student's formal name or their full name as that we have on record. So I wanna make sure that, um, that we're not changing that name. We are changing the display name. So if I want you to uh, take a look here. So here, for example, is a student, Alexander. Maybe Alexander likes to be called Alex or just for, uh, for for digital uh, citizenship for privacy purposes we don't want to show alex's full name so what you want to do is you want to go to the to the wrench here when you click that you want to go to where it says manage students and then we're going to go ahead and take a look at alex here so here's alex and when i click on alex's um <clears throat> alex's um name here I get more options. So take a look what I can do for Alex. This is where Sally was talking about. I can go ahead and give Alex a different icon. I'm not going to do that. But I can also, where it says display name, notice his display name here. When I click this, I can change that. And if I just want him, he goes by Alex. That's what he would like to be called. I can go ahead and do that. Once I put the name in, I press the back arrow here. And I want you to pay attention. Look, uh, look what happened here. Now his display name is Alex. And when we change that name, it does not change the, I guess his full name that's on record by, uh, by Power School Power Teacher. So um, great question. Thank you for uh, sending that in. I apologize, I don't have the name in front of me as to who sent that in, but I'm gonna go ahead and uh, change this back because um, Ben is probably going, what are you doing with my class? <laughs> so I'm gonna put it back and I want you to see here once again, it says Alex right now, when I press the back arrow here, there you go. It goes back to the way it was. So um, there you go. I hope that answered that question there. Let me see. Do we have any other questions, Celia, before we sign off? Um, there are there are some questions. Um, we're going to try to get to as many as we can right okay. now. Um, but just we appreciate the patience in case we don't get to yours right away. Remember, Monday will be uh, at all a Q&A. So we can, uh, we, we can definitely uh, answer more of those questions then. So one question is um, about the notifications that you would get on like Google Classroom. And so this teacher is saying that she just gets a lot of no notifications, but it's hard for her to find them once she tries to go look for them. So she's asking if there's a way to organize the comments on Google Classroom. I don't know that there is, unfortunately. I'm gonna... Yeah, as far as I know, I, I don't think there's, uh, there's a way to do that. Maybe... Uh... Maybe our director will jump in because he is, uh, you know, he might have more answers than we do. But I don't, um, think so. but I don't believe there is way that I, I believe that though when you get an email, if you click on that, it'll actually take you straight to the comment in Google Classroom. Um, I, I don't think that answers your question, but um, I don't yeah. believe it's the way. George, Josh? I, George, you're you're pretty much saying what I was going to say. Um, I think what she's asking. Uh, I, I think comments are now threaded in Google Classroom, but I don't think that's exactly what she's asking. And I think you're right when you click on the email post about um, you've gotten a comment that um, it should jump you right to that place in the stream. All right. Thank you, Josh, for that. Again, um, you know, we, we're learning from each other and sometimes we don't know all the answers. Hey, this teacher is asking that they recorded a video uh, using Seesaw, and however, it only posted to group A, so this might be a, yes, it's a kindergarten teacher, and she's wondering if there's a way to post to the same video to both the A group and the B group, and there is. It's super simple. George is so, going to demonstrate. All right, so I think you can see my screen on here, right? So I can double check, make sure people are seeing my screen, 
Am I not broadcasting here? Sorry, I apologize. Oops, sorry. No, you're fine. Okay, so I am. All right, so, so I'll show you how to do that. Um, so what I can do here is if I have an activity or a post that I want to share with my A and B group, because we don't want you kind of having to do posts twice, you can click the plus. You can go ahead and add the post on there. And I promise, Ben, I will not be posting to your class. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, and this is the post that I'm going to send. And then I'm going to go ahead and I like that. And then I'm going to assign it. So what I can do here, oh, maybe it only works for, right, maybe it only works for activities. Darn it. Looks like I just learned something. So um, that did not work that the way that I thought it was going to work. But I wanted to show you what um, the way I thought that it worked. It only works with activities. So with activities, if I wanted to add an activity, so perhaps if you create an activity, an activity, and then yeah, upload your video to an activity, then you would be able to assign. So you click assign here. The video would be attached, and notice I can choose. This would be my A group. This would be my B group, and you could send it out twice without having to do the post twice. So that's a workaround. I don't think. Uh, I think you did it probably as a post, which is why you had to um, do it twice. But uh, in the future, a uh, way to save you time would be to um, to go ahead and and create an activity. You would add the multimedia video here, and you would assign it to the, the Bay group and the B group. All right. I hope that I hope that helped. I'm sorry, I was incorrect about my assumption there. Somebody had a quick question about where to get the URL for your class blog on Seesaw. All right, so let's go back here and go back to class again. Thank you, Ben, in advance for letting me totally hijack your class. Yay, Ben. Uh, so to get the link, you want to go ahead, Celia. Um, it was once you've enabled the blog, and let's see if Ben has enabled it here. I have a feeling he has because that's how it works. So when I click on blog, first of all, it needs to be enabled. Here is the link that you would share with whoever right. um, you want them, whoever you want to see your blog. But that's not going to show up unless you enable the blog uh, in your classroom settings. That is uh, correct. All right. I hope that was helpful. Pretty uh, easy to question there. But thank you for that. Um, let's see. We're reviewing the questions. Sorry on the fly here. Last minute before I we log off. Maybe take one more. Somebody is asking if there's a way to see an overview of student participation and all of their po posts at the same time, similar to like an overview mm. on both Google Classroom and Seesaw? Ooh, what a great question. There actually right. is. So let me show you here. So I'm going to go in back to Ben's class on here. I'm in the journal. So one thing I wanted to share with you is that this is the journal. When you click, click class journal here, it will show, it's going to show 2,604 items. That's a lot. And those are all the posts in this class. If I am having, and this is pretty awesome if you're having a parent-teacher conference on here, if you're having a parent-teacher conference and you just want to see one student's work, you click on their name. So if I click on Alexander here, everything that shows up here is just Alex's work. That's all that you see here. I only see Alex's work. If I click on Anthony, then what shows here is just Anthony's work. So very powerful because if you're having a parent-teacher conference, you can just click on the student's name and then the parent could see just their child's work and maybe you know and and i noticed that for anthony it would have 116 items that anthony has posted alex 114 and so forth i think that hopefully answered your question there i think so i think so right. yeah was that it i think i think that's gonna be it for right now um so we might want to pass it back to josh at this point um and i think he's probably gonna close it off for us Yep, and thank you, Ben, for letting me use your class without permission. <laughs> uh, thanks, guys. So um, there were some things that were either not questions or just some other comments and things uh, I wanted to address before we um, uh, before we we fully signed off today. Um, so from uh, Jones, which it's not Mr. Jones, it's Jones from Chavez. Go Chavez. Um, he had this really, really cool tip, uh, just thinking about a new way to work when our kids are at home and we are at home. Uh, you can set up a challenge on Kahoot. So there's a Kahoot tip. So of our four factors, this is assess. Um, you can set up a challenge and have students complete test at their pace and even put a deadline when due. Completed successfully with my class this week. That's awesome, Jones. 
um, Lucy from VRB, when George was talking about the settings in Google Classroom that allow you to allow students to post and comment or just post or nothing, no commenting, no posting. She said, and this is a great idea, and I think um, this, this points to an interesting mindset is, you know, we tend to think of settings as things you set it and forget it. Um, really? Am I the only one who watches late night infomercials? Anyway, set it and forget it. Uh, but great setting to adjust times for posting and comments. Otherwise, Susie, students use it before 8 a.m. Uh, or e after evening hours. So you can turn on posting and commenting or turn on just commenting when school starts, right? When it's 8 o'clock or 8.05 or whatever time you want to get started. And then, um, so you don't have to worry about moderating those comments in your Google Classroom. You can turn that off at a certain time and you're not coming back to a whole ton of uh, comments that you haven't had a chance to look through. Um, these last two in green, um, uh, Yvette from Jesse Sanchez and Christina Mendoza from Jesse Sanchez. Way to represent Sanchez. Okay. Um, both of these say that they recorded videos and they're still processing. So Twitter, Edu Twitter was all a Twitter uh, today over this issue. Um, I have said for years, I bet you can't break Google or I, get you, I bet you can't break the internet. Well, guess what? When you send a whole nation of teachers home to remote instruct, uh, you certainly stress test the internet. Google is aware of this. It is testing their capacity in a way that I think is surprising them. Um, they have engineers on it right now. And I think the best we answer we can tell you is they are working on it, um, which I know is not a satisfying answer, but at least uh, um, the, the powers that be of the internet, which are pretty much Amazon and Google, um, are aware and are trying to expand capability so that this um, this doesn't keep happening, but it's it's not just us. It's not you. You haven't done anything wrong. Um, it's not because of us or our setup or IT. It is literally the internet, okay? Um, because millions of teachers are all trying to do what we are trying to do. So um, again, uh, we will see you tomorrow for digital citizenship. Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, in the meantime, keep trying new stuff. Try and manage that overwhelm. Be good to yourself. Be good to each other and be good to our kids. Until tomorrow, thank you so much. Bye-bye.